They Came Before Columbus, The African Presence in Ancient America by Ivan Van Schertema. Chapter 10, Plants and Transplants. The adoption of a new plant is no simple matter. It requires the adoption of a whole complex of knowledge about the plant's ecological requirements and often also about the human usages of the plant. The presence of even one transferred plant means that a quite effective contact has been made between two peoples. G. F. Carter, Movement of People and Ideas in Plants and Migrations, edited by J. Barrow. If someone could only prove that even a few of the basic crop plants of American origin were universally distributed in cultivation in both hemispheres in pre-Columbian times, one might be more lenient in judging the matter. E. D. Merrill Observations on Cultivated Plants with Reference to Certain American Problems Part 1 African Ancestors of American Cotton Professor Stevens peered into the pale Suba, subiquitous light of the tank. Three weeks had now passed since the cotton seeds were taken out of cold storage and set afloat on the artificial seawater. It was impossible, of course, to simulate all the complex conditions of the ocean in a laboratory tank. The ocean had its own inimitable surfaces the calm of glass, the turbulence of lava its own tones of utter darkness and soft subterranean lights, its billion fins and flow, its drift, its detritus. But the important thing in this experiment was the salination and temperature of the water, and he had tried to reproduce this as best he could by adding 35 grams of common table salt to each liter of water and by varying the temperature between 25 and 31 degrees centigrade. He had also changed the water at monthly intervals and not, as in 1964, kept the seeds in a tank under constant aeration, forcing air into the system by means of a small aquarium pump. This aeration had had a curious effect on some of the fibers still attached to the cotton seeds, charging them with air bubbles. He had not counted on that and he had assured himself it might actually help flotation enhance, perhaps, the buoyancy of the seeds. The experiment, however, had ended rather disappointingly. He had abandoned it after two months, since by that time there were hardly any seeds afloat. The new 1965 experiment was more complex. He had introduced a number of things, including tests on the viability of the seeds, their capacity to germinate even after sinking. His eyes moved slowly from one container to the other, studying closely each seed in the critical samples. There were 50 seeds to each sample. Several botanists had collected them from various parts of the world. Doctors Godillo, Kerr, Fosberg, Martorell, Gilham, and himself from the Pacific Islands the Caribbean, and the African Atlantic coast. The direction and speed of currents in the oceans and the points of possible departure and arrival had been carefully studied. The purpose of the experiment was to discover whether the various types of cotton got from one point to the other through simple drift across the surface of the oceans. In the first experiment, he had been primarily concerned with wild forms of cotton found in the South Pacific Islands and the Caribbean. A variety of the New World species, Gossipium hirsutum, had been found growing wild on several Caribbean islands, from a point on the coast of Venezuela right through the Antillean chain to the Yucatan Peninsula and the Florida Keys. Their distribution seemed to follow the path of the Gulf Stream current, and he wanted to find out if they could have drifted unaided by man from the coast of South America to their farthest points west and north. The entire journey was more than a thousand miles, but the distances between the islands were quite short. 
Island hopping on the warm, fast-moving belt of the Gulf Stream made it a manageable problem. Far more problematic, however, was the movement of the South Pacific cottons, which, while of the same New World species, Hirsutum, differed enough from the Caribbean variety of the species to suggest that they started their migration into the Pacific from some other center in the New World in all likelihood from a Central American base, for them to have made it from there to places like the Marquesas Islands and Hawaii, they would have had to drift along several branches of the Pacific currents, taking in some cases more than a year to arrive at their present locations. Could they have floated all that time? And even if they had, would they have survived intact and potent after so many months of salt water immersion? It was all very well and good for Professor Watt to have determined in his salt water tanks that the cotton variety Darwini of the New World species Gossipium barbadensa had drifted to the Galapagos Islands unaided by man from the coast of South America floating on the Peru current. That was no big drift. It was like the island hopping of Hirsutum in the Caribbean. Island hopping was one thing. Dispersal of seeds over vast tracts of ocean was another. Stevens frowned. In this new experiment, he was involved in an even more critical issue than that of the Pacific cottons. He had introduced two samples of African cottons into the containers. One of these, Anomalum, although it had remarkably tough seed coats and close affinities with the other variety, had fared very badly. That morning, the last floating seed in the sample had sunk. Still, the matter was far from settled. There was another important sample collected from the southern part of Africa, which was doing quite well. On it hung many hopes, for it was a wild variety of Gossipium herbaceum, the reputed ancestor of America's cultivated cottons. The grandfather, perhaps of both species, Hirsutum and Barbadensa. It lay at the very center of the controversy over the origins of the world's cultivated cottons. Thirty years before Stevens had started his experiment, Professor Harland analyzed the nature of the distinctions between the species of the world's cultivated cottons. Harland's work led to the acceptance of four species, and four only, to embrace the vast diversity of cultivated cottons. Of these four species, two are known as tetraploids and were formed in the New World. Two are known as diploids and originated in the tropical and subtropical areas of the Old World. But the genetic structure of the two New World tetraploids, G. hirsutum and G. barbadensa, indicates that they are the result of an ancient crossing between an Old World diploid and a wild New World type. Half of the 26 chromosomes found in the New World tetraploids are homologous with the complement of the Old World diploids, and half with the complement of species of the genus growing wild in the New World. These Old World diploids are G. herbaceum and G. arboreum. G. herbaceum is an African diploid cotton, and it is now recognized that G. arboreum, common to Pacific Asia, arose through a mutation of a species of G. herbaceum from Africa. The African G. herbaceum has emerged as the only likely diploid cotton which could have crossed with a wild New World type to form the New World tetraploids. Where the sample of herbaceum had been collected, however, by Dr. Gilham in southern Rhodesia, it would have taken five months at least, if unaided by man, to float across the Atlantic from Africa along the South Atlantic equatorial current to South America or the Caribbean. 
it would have had to drift nearly 3,000 nautical miles at the snail's pace of 20 miles a day. It would be of great interest, therefore, to know whether the seeds could have survived for this length of time. In the second month, however, the herbaceum seeds began to sink. While they might sink below the surface of the water, Stevens argued, reluctant to relinquish hope, they might still remain within the effective belt of the current, probably supported by drifting bits of timber dislodged from coastal forest or vegetation mats. The final test lay not with buoyancy, perhaps, but with viability. Would the seeds remain alive, submerged or not? That was the question. He therefore removed ten seeds from those that had sunk and air dried them in a desiccator. These seeds were then acid delinted. Their seeds coats were removed and the seeds were placed on germinating pads. His hunch was right. They were still healthy, fertile seeds. But his excitement over this was short lived. When he repeated it with some more seeds a little later, he had to admit that the hypothesis that African cotton seeds had drifted unaided across the Atlantic to America could not be supported. The herbaceum seeds were all dead. Tests of seed buoyancy and seed viability in experimental tanks of salt water, wrote Stevens in his report on these experiments, indicate that the upper time limit for seed buoyancy is a little over two months. This is sufficient to affect the transport of seeds over relatively short distances, e.g. throughout the Caribbean islands and from mainland South America to the Galapagos Islands, but totally inadequate for transatlantic or transpacific dispersal. Stevens' contribution, however, was extremely valuable. He had shown the limited applicability of the Watt experiment. He had forced botanists to look again at this troubling question, the question concerning the origin of the amphidiploid cottons as a whole, since their putative parents are confined to Africa and America respectively. By what means then had the links been made between the two cotton strains? For he had at least dismissed the possibility of unaided oceanic drift. Some botanists working on problems unrelated to the cotton controversy have considered the possibility of birds retaining seeds in their digestive tracts over long periods and depositing them on alien shores after transoceanic flights. This hypothesis has been examined by V. W. Proctor, and while it has been found that seeds of some plant species can remain viable in the intestinal tract of some shorebirds long enough to be transported thousands of miles, this can offer no explanation in the case of cotton. The cotton bowl is not one of the seeds birds feed on. Even if the bowl was swallowed by accident and regurgitated or excreted after an extended flight, it would retain neither form nor potency. Botanists have tried other ways to account for the meeting of the Old World and New World cottons. Since tropical parts of Asia, India, Pakistan have imported an African type of cotton, presumably in a wild state, and the domestication of cotton in Asia was thought to be, until very recently, of much greater antiquity than that in Africa. It was suggested that the Pacific was the key to the problem. The fragment of a fiber and string was reported in excavations at Mohenjo Daro in Sindh, Pakistan by A. M. Gulati and A. J. Turner in 1928. This fragment is dated about 3000 BC and it indicates a knowledge of cotton weaving. Now a movement from Asia across the Pacific to America not from outlying islands, but from the Indian Ocean, is a far more problematic proposition than the African-American journey, not only from the point of view of distance, but from the disposition of worldwide winds and currents. 
it was a desperate suggestion to deal with an inexplicable problem. Harland first advanced the Ocean Pacific hypothesis, going so far as to postulate a land bridge across the Pacific Ocean. No evidence has been found for any such land bridge, and botanists later suggested that the link was provided by civilized men migrating eastward from the Old World, that is Asia, and taking his cottons with him. What lent credence to this theory was not only the known antiquity of Asian cottons, but the fact that coastal Peru, which is on the Pacific side, appeared at one time to be the home of the American cottons. The search for ancient New World cotton in Peru was inspired by this hypothesis of an eastward migration to the Pacific mainland of South America and led to the discovery in 1948 by Dr. Junius Bird of the oldest known cotton textiles in the New World in the caves of Huaca Prieta. The Huaca Prieta site in Peru yielded materials dating back to 2500 BC. The discovery, however, did not prove that an Old World cotton from the Pacific had fused with a New World species in Peru. An examination of seeds Carpels and lint from the early Huaca Prieta deposits reveal nothing to suggest the presence of an Asian diploid cotton. Certain evidence seems to point to an Eastern South American origin for these Peruvian cottons, although they are distributed west of the Continental Divide. F. Angle, according to Hutchinson, reported groundnuts among the crops of the ancient pre-ceramic cotton using cultures of the Peruvian coast. These groundnuts originated east of the Andes, probably in northwestern Argentina, suggesting that the cultivators reached the coast from the mountains and not from the Pacific. If they came over the mountains, they presumably brought their cotton with them. This takes us back to the Atlantic. But other alternatives have to be examined. G. L. Stebbins has suggested that the diploid Old World parent of the New World cottons came to this hemisphere by way of China and Alaska across the Antarctic route. Sir Joseph Hutchinson, a world authority on cotton, has shown that this could not be so because cotton is a round-the-year shrub adapted to the arid tropics. According to Hutchinson, no member of the genus would grow in an ecological situation where temperate woodlands existed and no member of the genus would survive in a climate of winter frost. It is therefore reasonable to conclude that contact between the Old World and New World species did not come about by migration round the Pacific, either by a northern or southern route. Evidence has been presented recently which seemed for a while to rule out the possibility of human transport across the Atlantic from Africa as the origin of the American cottons. Botanist C. E. Smith and R. S. McNeish claimed in 1964 to have found even earlier evidence for the existence of cultivated cotton in the New World than that found by Byrd. Excavations in caves in the Tehuacan Valley area of southeastern Puebla show they claimed that cotton and other plants were cultivated as long as 7,000 years ago. That would be circa 5,000 BC. Smith and McNeese say the most remarkable cotton find is two segments of a cotton bowl excavated in Coxcatlan Cave in Zone. 16 and El Riego floor level date between 7200 BC and 5000 BC. Three carbon 14 dates for zone 16 are all around 5800 BC. These claims have been disputed by botanist Carl Schwerin and S. G. Stevens. 
Schwerin contends that, in spite of McNeish's claim for an earlier appearance, he has only one specimen from the El Riego floor level, dated between 7200 and 5000 BC, and absolutely no evidence of cotton in the intervening Coxcatlan phase, 5000 to 3400 BC. The best explanation for this apparent anomaly, Schwerin argues, is that that single specimen was intrusive from a higher level. The most recent discussion of the find, Stevens reports, that this specimen was indeed unearthed in a disturbed level of the Coxcatlan cave. This interpretation is further supported by Stevens' observations that the specimen is nearly identical to modern cultivated upland cotton and very unlike feral or wild cottons. It seems more likely that cotton did not appear in Mexico before 3400 BC, the next level on which specimens were found. Smith and McNeish have suggested that because of this early find of New World cotton, corrected and dated down by Schwerin and Stevens to read 3400 BC at the earliest, botanists should no longer look for an old world ancestor of the American hybrid cottons, but for some native wild American ancestor, genetically similar to the reputed old world ancestor. These gentlemen, however, despair of ever finding such a native ancestor and try to close the argument by saying that although the human transport theory is untenable, they must confess that the parental stocks contributing to the original hybridization may never be found. Work on the other side of the Atlantic Basin, however in Africa itself, has shown that the agricultural revolution came to West Africa, and particularly to the Mandate people, much earlier than was formerly supposed, as early as 5000 BC and that cotton cultivation in Sudanic Africa was of considerable antiquity. This therefore puts Africa back into the picture. Schwerin's condition that if Africa is to be considered a potential area of the old world from which this introduction may have been made, it would require a domestication not later than the 5th millennium BC seems to have been met. Agriculture was independently developed, circa 5000 BC, by the Negroes of West Africa, says George Peter Murdoch, an American anthropolo anthropologist, in his book, Africa, Its Peoples and Their Culture History. This was, moreover, a genuine invention, not a borrowing from other people. Furthermore, the assemblage of cultivated plants in noble from wild forms in Negro Africa ranks as one of the four major agricultural complexes evolved in the entire course of human history. The invention of agriculture in Negro Africa is most probably to be credited to the Mandate peoples around the headquarters of the Niger in the extreme western part of the Sudan, less than 1,000 miles from the shores of the Atlantic Ocean. Several botanists still believe that African cotton was introduced into India in a wild form and was domesticated there. But Murdoch, undertaking a tremendous interpretive task based upon the available literature, claims that one of the major contributions of the nuclear mandate people to the welfare of mankind was the domestication of cotton. Originally ennobled in the western Sudan, this textile plant was transmitted early to India, but did not reach Egypt until the 6th, 6th century BC. In the last few years, several researchers, Wrigley, Porteris, Anderson, Delcroy, and Vorfrey, Sharon, Davies, have supported the main thrust of Murdoch's thesis and have shown that agriculture, settled village life, and a number of impressive cultural achievements have considerable antiquity in Africa. This has led to a more favorable reception to the African Atlantic hypothesis 
and an abandonment of the Pacific ad- advocacy. During the 50s, Schwerin notes, Thor Heyerdahl alone suggested the probability that cotton reached the Americas by way of the Atlantic, although he believed it was carried by Near Eastern sailors. Since that time, it has been shown that G. Arboreum, common to Pacific Asia, arose through mutation of a species of G. herbaceum from Africa. Furthermore, the African herbaceum itself is more closely related to the New World cottons than is G. arboreum. This has led several authorities to suggest that the Old World parent may have come to the Americas across the Atlantic from Africa rather than across the Pacific from Asia. Even Hutchinson, who formerly favored a Pacific crossing, has agreed that the odds as well as the difficulties are equally good for a transatlantic introduction. In fact, Pacific advocates who are so eager to ignore or dismiss the African Atlantic hypothesis should bear in mind a number of things that argue strongly against their case, but not against the African proposition. The winds and currents in the Pacific do not favor a crossing from Asia to America. The main currents, in fact, run the opposite way and would be more likely to propel a craft from the Americas to Asia rather than from Asia to the Americas. The prevailing winds, the northeast and southeast trade winds, blow in the same direction as these currents, the north and south equatorial currents, and make it extremely difficult for a craft without great power to approach the Americas in low latitudes. Furthermore, if the voyage were an accidental drift voyage, it would have been almost impossible for the drifting craft to hold to a steady course right across the Pacific without being blown or pulled off course to the north or the south and carried back toward Asia, or at least into one of the chains of islands in the Pacific. It is clear from the above that the Asia to America journey is a veritable nightmare for accidental drift voyagers. The direct, simple, relatively short, almost inescapable West Africa to South America route is so free of these problems that only centuries of blindness to the cultures of the African has made the contemplation of the infinitely more complex drift journey from Asia in a prehistoric time more acceptable and attractive. Again, it must be noted that cultivated cotton appeared later in Asia than America. As Schwerin points out, it did not reach China until the 7th century AD. It was unknown to the original Austronesians at the time of their immigration into the Pacific and Indian Oceans. Furthermore, the cottons of the Indian subcontinent and of East Asia belong to a species, G. arboreum, which, on cytogenetic grounds, is unlikely to have been ancestral to the New World cottons. Finally, while there are many grounds of similarity between African and American agricultural techniques, it has been demonstrated that the techniques of American agriculture are markedly different from those of Eurasia. All roads of argument lead back to Africa. A drift voyage by African fisher folks in the 4th millennium BC is the answer. The Great Antiquity of African Agriculture which began several centuries before that date. The very early ennobling of cotton, as Murdoch puts it, in the ancient Sudanic agricultural complex and the proven capacity of very small, unsophisticated craft to make it across the Atlantic. All these factors make this suggestion of Schwerin's tenable. Pre-Columbian contact between Africa and America in the latter half of the 15th century has also been proven by another aspect of the cotton evidence. There were Haitian reports of large boats from Guinea trading with them before Columbus. These reports would seem to be supported by evidence that these African Atlantic traders on one of their return voyages about the year 1462 brought back a species of New World cotton with them and introduced it into the Cape Verde Islands. 
Europeans first became acquainted with the Cape Verde Islands, according to Ribeiro, between the years 1460 and 1462, in which time there were no signs of former habitations. This was approximately 30 years before Columbus sailed to the New World. The botanist S.G. Stevens reports, Attempts at settlement of the Cape Verde Islands quickly followed, and by 1466, cottons from Guinea had been introduced and had already become semi-feral. During the subsequent colonial period, cotton was collected in the wild and also grown under primitive cultivation for export. Today, according to Teixeira and Barbosa, 1958, it occurs in a wild, subspontaneous state in the arid areas of most of the islands. It is a New World cotton. G. Hirsutum ver punctatum. It is clear that if the wild cottons of today are the descendants of the cottons introduced from Guinea between 1462 and 1466, then a New World cotton must have been established in Africa before Columbus's first voyage. This, then, is the case for cotton. After 50 years of speculation, archaeological discovery, and botanical debate, Africa has not been dismissed as the source of the ancestor of the New World tetraploids, nor have the African Atlantic journey and the human transport theory become less tenable. Several things are clear. First, that an African diploid cotton, G. herbaceum, crossed with a wild New World cotton several thousand years ago to form the New World tetraploid cottons, G. hirsutum and G. barbadensa. Second, that seeds of the African diploid cotton could not have drifted by themselves across the ocean, but had to come to the New World in the hands of African man. Third, that African man bearing cottons made the drift journey to the Americas in the 4th millennium BC. Finally, that in another series of African-American contexts in the 15th century, Africans took a tetraploid cotton from the New World, G. hirsutum ver punctatum, which was introduced into the Cape Verde Islands between 1462 and 1466. Part 2 Pre-Columbian Bananas and Peruvian Graves As he looked down from the rim of the grave on the top of the mountain, the mourners seemed like a mass of ants writhing their way upward with a heavy burden and morsel. The slow beat of the drum sounded at measured intervals. The plaintive flute call made all the more melancholy the ceaseless wail and lamentation of the women. Guayana Capa was dead. A king of the Incas had fallen. The digger leaned on his spade, waiting on the edge of the pit for the body of the great lord. He had dug many graves. Death, the burial of the dead, was mere routine. This time, however, he felt, after hours of labor in the sun, the chill of ice in his bones. He had heard tales of the death of kings. At their passing, hundreds of people of all ages were ritually slain. There was no telling who would be called upon today to follow the king on his journey to the afterworld. Slowly to the pit they came and he could see the shining skulls of the king's wives shaved clean out of grief and respect. Some of them had already gone wild and their wills were no longer in tune with the grieving chorus. They broke from the mass of mourners uttering shrieks of incredible anguish and terror hoping, lunging at phantoms, rolling upon the rock and pebbled grass of the ground. 
The great mummy pack containing the king was lowered into the pit. A sadness that had nothing to do with grief smote him. There in the deepest pit he had ever seen dug, they were burying some of the finest treasures in the world. That pack, he knew, contained not only food and drink, that the king might not suffer hunger and thirst on his journey, but the most marvelous jewels and plumes, the richest, finest cloth, and that all that was needed to ensure a happy passage were his pets and his companions. The digger braced himself. The time for filling the pit had come. Some of the king's wives leaped into the bowels of the earth and lay still at the feet of their beloved lord, waiting to be covered. Others were pushed over the side. Some had to be dragged and beaten as they struggled, bludgeoned and kicked as they tried to scramble their way up the steep sides of the pit. He began with the rest of the diggers to hurl the earth full and fast at them spade after spade until he could see only the quake and convulsion of living bodies in the ground. Their terrible faces had vanished. These burials in the lofty parts of the mountains had not fully ceased when the Spanish came. It was with Guayana Capa, however, that the ritual slaughter of wives on the death of a king was last recorded. This ancient practice probably passed with his passing, but the burial of the dead with food and drink, jewels and textiles, and even arms continue up to Colombian contact times. It was not the reserve of kings, but became widespread among the common people, who kept their dead relatives happy by renewing their food and clothes and drink. There is no graveyard on this continent more steeped in mystery and antiquity than the necropolis of Ancon in Peru. Here lie the bodies of Inca kings and nobles, their treasures, their retinues, and their wives. Some of these ancient graves were opened before the coming of the Spanish and their grave contents renewed. Among these later contents of medieval vintage, which excavators have unearthed, there are items which have never been explained. One of these is the banana. Banana leaves and fruit, the fruit being seedless and belonging therefore to the cultivated species of the banana, were identified by botanists who examined mummy packs in Ancon tombs. No native species of the Musa paradisiaca, the banana and its sister variety, the plantain, from which this gray fruit could have evolved, can be traced to America. How then did the banana, an old world plant, arrive in Peru before Columbus? The botanist E. D. Merrill proposed that the banana was first introduced into the New World by the Portuguese via the Cape Verde Islands off Africa. This has since been accepted as the official version and Thomas D. Berlanga, Bishop of Panama, has been credited with the introduction of this plant into the Americas in the year 1516. Both historical and archaeological evidence, however, refute Merrill's theory and those of his followers. This evidence is presented here, evidence which points not only to the pre-Columbian presence of the banana in America, but to its introduction from an African Atlantic source. Although the Musa Paradisiaca did not originate in Africa and only diffused to Africa by way of the Arabs as late as the 13th century, it was definitely in cultivation in West Africa before the Mandingo journey of 1310 and its transference to South America by the Mandingo explorers in the 14th century and or the Songhai traders of the 15th 1462-1492 is the most likely explanation for its pre-Columbian presence in this hemisphere. Among 16th century chroniclers and historians who claim the presence of a pre-Columbian banana plantain in Peru were Father 
Montesinos, Guamain Poma, Father J. Da Acosta, Blas Valera, and the half Inca historian Garciaso de la Vega, Alphonse de Candoye, in his celebrated botanical classic Origin of Cultivated Plants, dismisses all such claims, particularly the arguments advanced in their favor by the famous explorer Alexander von Humboldt. De Candoye assumed that if these assertions were correct, there would have to be a case for a native banana plant. No such case, he demonstrated forcefully, could be established. Humboldt had argued for a native species on the grounds that there were Native American names for the banana. This claim, however, has no validity. Quite apart from any of De Candoye's arguments, we can show that the names he cites are derivations of common Arab African banana names. The case for a pre-Columbian banana in South America does not rest, however, on the statements of a few historians or on the arguments of Humboldt. Notwithstanding De Candoye's dismissal of these, extensive excavations by Sisak and Savitaire in the necropolis of Ancon, the sacred cemeteries of Peru, unearthed evidence on behalf of the banana. The botanist A.T. de Rochebrun reported on the discovery of both banana leaves and fruit in a tomb at Ancon. The fruit being seedless and therefore belonging to the cultivated species of Musa paradisiaca. It was the custom of the Peruvian Indians to bury their chiefs in the way the Egyptians buried their pharaohs. Their wives, attendants, pets, treasures, clothing, food and wine were placed in the graves so as to be close at hand for use in the afterlife. Pedro Cieza de Leon, who traveled in Peru from 1532 to 1550 and who, according to C. R. Markham, examined every part of the empire of the Incas within a few years of the conquest, gives an account of how the native Indians buried their dead caciques, chiefs. When a chief dies, de Leon reported, they make a very deep sepulchre in the lofty parts of the mountains, and after much lamentation, they put the body in it, wrapped in many rich cloths, with arms on one side and plenty of food on the other, great jars of wine, plumes, and gold ornaments. At his feet, they bury some of his most beloved and beautiful women alive, holding it for certain that he will come to life and make use of what they have placed around him. On De Gardo, another authority on Peru, details the burial ceremonies of the common people. It is easy to see from this why bananas and other kinds of fruit and food were found preserved in the mummy packs. The people believed that the souls suffer hunger, thirst, or other inconveniences, and so they offer in the sepulchres chica and food, silver, clothes, wool and other things which may be useful to the deceased. The sacred cemeteries in Peru date back more than 2,000 years. At Ancon, however, numerous mummies have been found at various depths, dating from AD 200. The great antiquity of the graves could prove misleading, for the objects within the mummy packs are much more recent, particularly the food and the textiles. 13th, 14th, and 15th century. They are of a relatively modern period, says Gonzalez de la Rosa, but in any case anterior to when the Spanish came. No Spanish objects have been found in these graves. The relative recency of the food and textiles 
is accounted for by the unusual burial practices in Peru. The Hawakas, houses of the dead, were like ancestral shrines, although in many respects the way the great chiefs of Peru were buried closely parallels the way the pharaohs of ancient Egypt were buried. The Peruvian burial customs were later vulgarized. That is, they ceased to be the prerogative of chiefs and were indulged in by almost everyone. In ancient Egypt, there had been a great obsession with the royal dead. Hundreds were slaughtered when a pharaoh died. Likewise, at the death of Guayana Capa, the last Inca, 1,000 persons of all ages were killed. But whatever sacrifices were made at the time of the death of the pharaohs, however monumental were the tombs built for them, at least they lay in peace for thousands of years before man began invading the privacy of the pyramids. This was not the case in Peru. In Peru, there was an obsession with the bodies of the dead, not only the royal dead, but the family dead. The dead were buried and reburied, clothed and reclothed, fed and refed. These people would open the tombs, renew the clothing and the food placed in them, and in many instances gather the remains of the dead together and reinter them. This led to the inadvertent or intentional regrouping of ancestors. X-ray pictures taken by A. Bassler of mummy packs in the Royal Museum of Anthropo Anthropology in Berlin show the remains of several skeletons bundled into one mummy pack. These practices were discontinued under the Spanish. The Sisak and Savatira excavations with unearthed, which unearthed the bananas in the Peruvian graves also unearthed yams. It is interesting to note that Leo Wiener accepts the yams as African introductions but not the bananas. This is due to a misreading of the stems and African banana names which led him to conclude that the banana was introduced late into West Africa by the Portuguese. Wiener was not alone in making this linguistic error. M.D.W. Jeffries has shown how S.W. Coeli 1854, J.W. Christaller, 1933, and Roland Porteris, 1959, mistook, like Wiener, the Boro and Poro stems in West African words as reference for the Portuguese. They regarded, for example, the Poro in Porobana the vi name for banana as proof that the banana was a Portuguese post-Columbian introduction into Africa. The Arabs introduced the banana into Spain where it was cultivated in the 12th century and it passed into the Arab African trade not much later. Several West African tribes the Mano, Kisi, Chishi, Uwe, Ga, Fanta, and Crepe all have Boro and its variants prefixing their names for the banana. Bolo, Blofo, Borofo, Bolo, etc. They in no way confirm a European, that is a Portuguese introduction. These prefixes were used by West Africans as terms for the Arabs long before the coming of the Europeans, as P. K. Reynolds points out. The Arabs were instrumental in distributing this fruit across equatorial Africa. The banana was gradually carried westward by the native tribes and was well established on the Guinea coast when the Portuguese first explored there in 1469. If the banana seen in Peru by the early Spaniards and excavated in the pre-Columbian cemeteries of the Incas did not come from pre-Columbian visitors to America, only one other possibility remains to be established. That possibility, as Humboldt contended, is that there was a native variety of the Musa Paradisiaca, 
which what facts support this contention? Humboldt claimed that there were native words for the banana plant. He points to banana words among two American tribal groups and languages. The name Paruru in the Tamanaco language and the name Arata among the Maipuri Indians. These words seem at first to be far removed from the universal words for the banana and the plantain. The platana and platano of the Arabs, Africans, and Spanish. But when we look at their variants as they pass through a number of American languages, we realize that they are intimately connected with the main source after all, and are not native, as Humboldt claims, to these two American tribes and languages. We see Paruru, for example, very close to Paratunu, another banana word in another American language. Paratunu to Paratano, Paratano to Paratona, Paratana to Pratina, Pratania to Platania, Platania to Platino, the last of these being the source of most of the banana words found throughout Africa and the Arab and Spanish worlds. When we look at the Maipuri word for the banana, Arata, we see clearly its relationship to P. Arata no, which brings us back again to Paratana, Pratana, Platana, Platano. All these little steps of sound on the staircase of words which we can climb up and down through the House of American Languages leads us back to the ground words in banana and plantain culture. A spiral of steps winding its way from the main staircase may be seen in other American words for banana, the small variety, derived from the African bacoco. Thus we have in the American language Galibi, the banana word Bakuku in the Oyapak language the banana word Bako in Oyampi the word Bakome in Tupi the word Pakoba in Apiakis the word Pakoa in Puri the word Bajo in Karoda the word Bakuing the African banana word runs right through these American languages. This word stands for a small African variety of banana and it is a small African variety that is one of the keys to the question. There seem to have been two main varieties of banana introduced into Africa. The small variety was an offshoot of the Arab transplant in the centuries prior to Columbus and a larger variety became widespread in the Sudan and the Congo through Spanish and Portuguese influence in the later period. It is this small variety popular in pre-Columbian Africa which de, de Acosta probably describes when he identifies a small white and delicate banana in Peru during the first decade of the conquest. Da Acosta testifies that these bananas were grown in Haiti, not Peru, and that they were brought into Peru across the Andes, which fits in with the African-Caribbean contact. Haiti was the first of the islands to report pre-Columbian trade with the Africans, as well as with an African settlement or settlements cultivating this crop along the Atlantic seaboard. No native variety, as Humboldt claimed, has ever been established. The only other claim of this nature was made by Liano y Zapata, who reported in 1761 that in addition to the bananas introduced into America from the Cape Verde in 1516 and from Guinea in 1605, there was yet another cordio, or white species of banana. As we have shown, this small white banana, as Da Acosta describes it, 
is the African species brought into Peru across the Andes from the direction of the Caribbean. The Peruvians, in fact, have an oral tradition which tells of blacks coming to them from across the Andes. Asa Gray and J. Hammond Trumbull, in their critique of the first revised volume of Alphonse de Candolier's Origin of Cultivated Plants, reopened the issue of the banana. The Scandinavians, who had carried their expeditions to the northern United States, and the Basque of the Middle Ages, who had extended their whaling voyages perhaps to America, would appear not to have transported a single cultivated species. The Gulf Stream has equally been without effect. Between America and Asia, two transplants may have been affected. One by man, Botatas, the sweet potato, the other either by man or by the sea, the coconut. Perhaps the banana should be ranked with the above in this regard. Like Hyredal after them, Gray and Trumbo were suggesting a Pacific origin for the pre-Columbian banana found in America. This suggestion does not fit any of the known facts. The heaviest concentrations of banana and plantain cultivation found in places where the Spanish had not yet penetrated were along the upper reaches of the Amazon River, Atlantic side. Bananas were found only in small ritual deposits but not in cultivation on the Pacific side the earliest chronicle which makes reference to a pre-Columbian banana such as the Acostas points to an Atlantic source. All the names of American bananas post or pre-Columbian are of Arab, African, not Polynesian or New Guinean origin. American bananas we must conclude both pre and post-Columbian dispersed from African sources. As the distribution of names for the American varieties of the Musa paradisiaca clearly shows. The banana, although it did not originate in Africa, was introduced there very early in Spain as early as the 12th century. Into Africa not much later, at least by the 13th, through the Arab caravan trade in the Sudan and through the Asian and Arab maritime trade with East Africa. The research by Reynolds into early banana culture establishes the pre-Columbian cultivation of the banana in West Africa. No extended trip contemplated by the Africans in 1310, 1311 or later in their trade with the Caribbean in the mid-15th century could have excluded bananas or plantain, the sister variety of the Musa paradisiaca. It seems that a small variety of banana was in popular cultivation in West Africa before the coming of the Europeans, Portuguese, who made a larger variety widespread in the Congo and the Sudan. It was a small variety similar to the West African pre-Columbian banana that was reported in Haiti and Peru at the time of the contact by Spanish and Portuguese historians. The explorer Orellana encountered the plantain variety of the species in great abundance all along the upper reaches of the Amazon where he drifted down the river, the longest jungle river in the world, to its mouth in 1540-1541. The plant geographer Carl Sauer has shown how difficult it is for the plantain variety to spread quickly without a very active human crusade on its behalf. Its multiplication is a lot more difficult than that of a seed-bearing plant which practically spreads itself. The mature root stocks of the plantain, Sauer points out, need to be dug up, divided, preferably dried for a while and then replanted. This species is an extraordinarily poor volunteer and its spread must have been almost entirely by deliberate and rather careful planning. It is clear from the above that those who still insist on a post-Columbian introduction of the banana by Europeans as the origin of its presence in America ignore not only the eyewitness accounts of the early chroniclers 
and the archaeological evidence of the Ancon graves, but also the intensive cultivation and extraordinary dispersal of the plant and its sister variety on the Atlantic side of the continent and the extremely dependent and slow spreading nature of the plant itself. He was drawn to the dome shaped object bobbing up and down on the current not far from his feet. It looked at first like the head of a bald man with a solitary tuft of hair done up in a curious knot in the middle of his skull. He guided it in with a stick and picked it up. It was larger and lighter than a human head and the mysterious knot in the center of the skull was a stem. After the day's hunt he took it back with him to his cave. He tried to break it open with a stone to see if it was indeed a fruit and if the flesh within was good and sweet. The stone made only slight indentations in the brittle shell, which was as protective and tough as the hide of an animal. In a rage he threw it down and stamped on it. It broke into two halves. It was quite hollow inside. A film of flesh, which may have once been soft, still clung to the inner rim of the shell. It seemed infested with seeds. The man spat. It was certainly not good for meat, but perhaps, perhaps, the thought was to return to him much later, more complete. But this time he simply threw the gourd down on the trash heap. The bottle gourd picked up on the beach by this aboriginal American is an ancient plant. It is among man's first cultivated plants. It served many functions before man be began making pots from clay. It could be used as a float, a container, a scoop, and a dipper, and was probably used for all these purposes by prehistoric fishermen. Gourds occur very early in both the Old and New Worlds, but in spite of the differences in the shape of the seeds from the two hemispheres, the varieties are known to branch from a single species. This species originated in tropical Africa and according to the botanist Burkill and Oaks Ames was originally domesticated there. Thomas Whitaker, the leading authority on the cultivated cucurbits, also leans toward that view. The early branching off from the African Legionaria has produced New World seeds of the bottle gourd that are small, narrow, and without wings, while seeds of the African gourd are usually broad and corky. There are, however, New World seeds of the gourd found in early archaeological sites, from Peru to Baja California, Mexico, that are broad, just as there are African types that resemble the slender hard and wingless seeds of the New World. Most botanists hold that the bottle gourd was introduced into the Americas by natural drift across the ocean. Carl Schwerin suggests that in some prehistoric time, beginning about 9,000 years ago, bottle gourds got caught up in the pull of currents from the African coast and drifted to America across the Atlantic. Experiments have shown that such a drift voyage could in fact occur Thomas Whitaker and G. F. Carter showed that gourds are capable of floating in seawater for at least seven months, long enough to reach South America from Africa without appreciable loss of seed viability. Salt water does not harm these seeds, just the opposite. Direct immersion of Lagenaria seeds for up to 14 weeks actually seems to have a stimulating effect. As we have seen, this kind of occurrence would have been impossible for the African cotton seeds. The botanist S. G. Stevens demonstrated this in laboratory tests. Only man could have transported African cotton seeds across the Atlantic. Man, it would appear, was not really necessary for the diffusion of the bottle gourd. There is nonetheless one problem in connection with the gourd that has caused several authorities, including Whitaker, to add the cautionary note that introduction by human transportation 
remains a distinct possibility. The bottle gourd is not a littoral plant. That is, it does not grow along the shoreline of the Atlantic where it would have landed after its long slow drift. If it is true that African gourds simply got lost and drifted westward until they hit the American mainland, why did they never appear in cultivation along the waterline or littoral, but only far inland? This has led to the speculation that an ancient American may have picked up the gourd on the seashore, taking it inland with him to a settlement and breaking it open, inadvertently dispersed the seeds, which then took root in the New World. This seems a plausible explanation. Bottle gourds appear so early in America that it would be rash to claim unequivocally a direct introduction by African man. In fact, as Whitaker at one point suggests, the diffusion of the gourd from one continent to another may have even preceded its domestication by man. On the northern borders of Mesoamerica, the gourd is reported at Tamaulipas in Mexico from strata radiocarbon dated at 7000 to 5500 BC. It occurs much later in South America. The earliest firm date in South America is 3000 BC at Huaca Prieta on the northern coast of Peru. Other crops of definite African origin which have turned up in pre-Columbian strata in the New World include a species of jack bean the result of an ancient crossing between African and American beans and a West African yam Dioscoria cayenensis Some scholars have argued for an introduction of both the bottle gourd and the jack bean from Asia This is hardly worth consideration First of all, they are both found earliest in America on the Atlantic side Second, Bottle gourds and beans appear in much later archaeological context in Asia than they do in America. Third, the Asiatic jack bean, Canavalia gladiata, is quite distinct from the New World species. The member of the bean family we are considering, the jack bean, Canavalia, grew from an early marriage between African and New World beans. Red seeds from Africa. Canavalia verosa hybridized around 4000 BC with white seeds Canavalia plagiosperma these model seeds when carried into the Amazon lowland a habitat like that of the ancestral red seeds of Africa C verosa gave rise through repeated back crossing to brown seeds C papyri Beans, unlike gourds, could not have survived a transatlantic drift. The red seeds can float for a short time, but they are not impermeable to water, and so swell up and sink. Other Canavalia beans are neither buoyant nor impervious to the effects of water, and so the explanations put forward for the pre-Columbian transfers from Africa to America of the jack bean include 1. A sealed gourd with the seeds packed inside. Two, storm driven fishermen bringing the beans. And three, an abandoned watercraft with the beans on board. The sealed gourd explanation is highly improbable. Why should Africans seal a gourd packed with jack beans and set it adrift? And with respect to the abandoned watercraft, one has to imagine that the Americans who found the craft knew the usefulness of the beans and the technique of their cultivation. That men came in on the watercraft, surviving the long drift journey is not to be dismissed as improbable, in view of what is now known of the seaworthiness of small craft, the currents traversing the floor of the Atlantic, and the capacity for strong storm-driven fishermen to survive much longer accidental ocean voyages, utilizing their equipment, which turns the ocean into a mobile food store. These men, moreover, would know both the usefulness of the plants and the technique of propagating them. The journeys of these prehistoric fisherfolk 
as Schwerin has pointed out, are matched in improbability only by other explanations. Because fishing cultures are uncommon in Western, Western Africa, they have been neglected ethnographically. Yet, fishermen have probably been important as specialists for a long time, catching and drying great quantities of fish which could be traded long distances inland. Indigenous peoples of West Africa were no strangers to travel on the open sea prior to European contact. And fishing in the open sea has continued among scattered West African groups down to the present. Very early drift voyages without man are postulated for the diffusion to America of the African bottle gourd, and with man for a species of cannavalia bean. Yams, however, were a much more recent introduction, and their pre-Columbian presence in the Americas may be seen as further evidence of the medieval African contact with America. The Spanish naturalist G. F. D. Oviedo makes it clear that yams were not native to America. Their name, pronounced Nyam, is a foreign fruit, writes Oviedo, and not native to these Indies, having been brought to this Hispaniola, Haiti, and to other parts of the Indies. It came with the Negroes, and it was taken well and is profitable and good sustenance for the Negroes. These nyams look like the ayes, the sweet potato, but they are not and generally are larger than the ayes. They cut them in pieces and plant them a hand's distance from the ground, and they grow. Yams were another of the cultigious found preserved in the mummy packs of the Incas in Peru. One of the problems that has arisen in discussions of the yam is the confusion over its name. Wiener says, Aye is the original name of the yam, and not of the sweet potato, but throughout the world the two were confused and the same name often served for both. After reviewing many of the early chronicles on this point, Schwerin is convinced that the Ayes reported by Oviedo, Las Casas, and others represent a species of yam, Dioscorea. He holds that a species of yam that may have been introduced into America in a pre-Columbian time is Dioscorea cayenensis, which is widespread in tropical America and which most authorities consider had its original home in West Africa. End of chapter 10